Hey guys, and welcome to the show. We're going to do another Azure episode, and I know that we keep these coming, but Azure is a pretty cool thing. And uh, today we have Carol Moon talking to us. By the way, uh, just a shout out to my uh, daughter's IT class. Uh, I understand there's a drinking game every time I say awesome. I'm sure she means Coca-Cola, right? Hey, Carol, what's up, bud? Hey, Lex. Good morning. <laughs> uh, you're still in Virginia, I take it? Yes, sir. I still am. I still am. Awesome. You're in Charlotte? Oh, yeah, man. I'm not going anywhere. It's good. It's good. Yeah, so for our viewers out there, Carol and I have worked together for years and years and years and years. And uh, awesome guy. Glad to have you back. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for having yeah, me. Yeah, man. So today you're going to talk to us about Azure. Yes, Azure and operations, really, as a customer is moving um, any any workload, any line of business application or whatever it is they're moving to Azure, there are a number of things that we need to focus on to help them be successful with service management and operations. So I want to I wanna try to help uh, simplify that conversation for them. Yeah, and that's the key, guys, right? We've done several shows on Azure and how to do things, how to set up Azure, um, how to manage Azure um, from a... Uh, technical standpoint, right? Um, how to set up VPNs. We've done all of the technical things, and we've got some more Azure coming. We've got uh, uh, the uh, the whole uh, you know Azure as a service thing coming up. Uh, but what we don't have is what this means for IT professionals that have to manage it. And so I think this is going to be a great episode. Okay, so what we want to talk about is what we are calling at Microsoft Modern Service Management uh, and really want to focus that on services underpinned by Azure. So as we all know, uh, things are changing with respect to operations as workloads move to the cloud, uh, whether it be a, a, a SaaS service being consumed, whether part of a line of business application is going to be hosted on top of Azure or otherwise. And so that's the topic for today. And really... Best, we need best practices, and so we need best practices on I'm moving this line of business app to Azure. How do I monitor? How do I handle major incidents? What, what needs to evolve from my roles and responsibilities for my ops team versus my development team, perhaps? And so best practices come over time, and usually they come through lots of mistakes or trial and error. The challenge with anything new is it's sort of a catch-22. We need to learn from other people's mistakes. But the problem is the cloud's so new, where do you get that experience since everyone sort of in the industry is moving at the same time? And so the good news for us is our product groups have been operating in this model for quite some time. Uh, in the last show that Lex and I did together, we talked about my background uh, in Office a product group for uh, about 10 years or what is now in Office 365. And so we've got a lot of opportunity, what we've done in Office, what we've done in the Azure product groups, what we've done in Xbox Live, for example, uh, in this world. And so there's a lot of learning to be, um, to be had there. Now, the funny thing is we've done this before. We, 15 years ago, uh, almost 15 years to the day almost that I started at Microsoft. Lex has been here quite a while longer. Um, but we, we were going through this shift. We were moving from centralized computing to the distributed world, and uh, we all learned the hard way. But if we roll back the clock, and I, if I were to ask you, how important is email to you today versus 15 years ago, it obviously is much more important. And if I said, took to any CIO uh, on the planet and said, how important is your, your technical services, your IT services, how important are they to your business today versus 15 years ago, it's, it's an easy answer. They're much more important. So the stakes are higher now, and so we've got to get it, I think, more right uh, as an industry than we did 15 years ago. Now, there are a handful of common triggers that you know, moving to the cloud is one of the triggers. But the, 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 the best practices I'm going to talk about today, really, for any of these five discussions, are the same. Running a service at scale, uh, run, consuming cloud services, the DevOps movement uh, you know, is, is a big thing uh, in the industry right now. If a customer is moving one or more applications to the cloud, which is a little different than consuming cloud services, or, and then consuming services from a SaaS provider, basically, the best practices will evolve to be the same things. It's sort of like it, no matter how hard we tried to make a, a, a new wheel 
for a car, it's always going to be round. And so the funny thing is about these best practices is they just they just are. And the, the question is how quickly do we as an industry uh, learn them and how quickly do we as Microsoft uh, package up the things or provide the guidance to our customers from the things our product groups uh, have, have all already uh, actually learned, I think, a lot of it the hard way. Lex, is that something you see with your customers as well, the need for this discussion? It is, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think one of the things that uh, I, I sense that there's a lot of fear out there uh, about is, you know, what happens to the guys that currently manage their servers in their own environments. And mm -hmm. and the answer is, I don't think a lot of that changes. I mean, some of the interfaces will change, right? We've got a web interface, et cetera. And, but for the most part, um, when a customer moves their, their workloads to Azure, you know, we, we provide the servers, we provide the infrastructure, but they still have to manage it. So so those roles don't change a whole lot, right? That's right. That, well, it, yes and no. I think the part of it is that, that really is, an, what, if I were to categorize myself as an IT operations person, the the reality is, just like in any career, if I were a doctor, I would constantly have to be retooling and learning to be able to stay relevant. Medicine today is very different than it was 10 years ago. The same is true for an IT ops professional. Uh, at any level of management within our companies, um, you have to constantly retool. And so the key, I believe, for IT operations to to stay relevant and to continue to provide value to the business is to re continue to retool and to really treat themselves more and more like, instead of an operations team, more to look at themselves as a, um, a group who provides a series of services to their businesses or to their customers. And those services like monitoring as a service or like change management as a service or release management as a service, those things with the quantified inputs, quantified outputs with quality measured is really what the evolution needs to ha ha uh, needs to happen it's a good segue though so sort of in the legacy world the way if I look at operations is sort of the blue uh, square here and application teams is the is the black squares with the arrows you know applications re the reality is operations sort of controlled things and uh, in a good way and, and the intention for controlling things was to reduce business risk and to ensure service continuity and to ensure that we're not duplicating effort and and I you know, usually they would control things through processes, but even if an app dev team, you know, went off on their own, at the end of the day, everything was controlled physically by the capacity acquisition. You had to go through a process to procure a server. You had to go through a process to put server in the data center. Now, the the new world with the cloud and this app dev lens is really awesome because it's like, wow, I am no longer bounded by capacity. I've got unlimited capacity. I've got unlimited agility and I'm no longer sort of bound in chains. Now the problem with that, like you said, from an ops perspective is everyone's thinking, oh my goodness, what, what am I going to do in the new world? Uh, what about business risk? You know, if every app team is off doing their own thing, what am I going to do with respect to service continuity and, uh, and security and how are we handling that? And then the third piece is sort of this duplication of effort. If every app team is building their own scripts to page themselves when there's a, a failure in the app, then that's a duplication of effort. We're probably not investing in the right ways. And, and so those are the things that ops usually is concerned about, the things that ops is concerned about. And then, by the way, shadow IT, this idea of a business unit using a credit card and bringing in software, that stuff is scary to have dev teams and our, comp our customers and within Microsoft even for that matter for the same reasons. It's, you know, what do I do it is sort of our inner thoughts and then it's what, uh, how is this going to impact my business, uh, which is our verbalized uh, discussion. And what we really need to enable is this concept of modern service management. This is the evolved IT op shop, if you will. Uh, they really need to think just like an app dev team. And so in this example, if every, if, if we've got 50 application teams at a company, uh, if they were the unbounded, taking the completely unbounded approach, and every app team was spending a dollar to instrument scripts to page themselves when the app failed, then that's $50 being spent for the enterprise. It probably makes more sense to say, look, we're going to centralize some of these duplicate, duplicative steps, and we're going to spend $25, and we're going to fund ops or fund modern service management to do it and run that as a service so that every team, you know, you've got one set of paging scripts, one set of ticketing scripts, one set of, you know, humans backstopping that automation to make sure it's successful, and we're investing enough to make it be successful, but we're investing less as an all-up business than we would have been doing with a completely disparate approach. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, absolutely. So centralization equals less cost, essentially. Yeah, but you've got to, we also need to be careful. There's a balance there because what you don't want, and I'll use a monitoring example, if you sort of look at the old, this will actually help draw the line between new world and old world ops. In the old world, usually customers have an operations team that own monitoring. And so if you take email, like Exchange and Monitoring Exchange, you got the guys, they own SCOM, and they're also accountable for the Exchange management packet if Exchange goes down. A lot of times on-premise, if Exchange goes down, you, know, you may have a lot of alerts, but usually what is initiating the bridge on-premise for a customer is they get a bunch of calls to the help desk, the help desk stands up a bridge, and everybody races to the bridge. So monitoring isn't necessarily the thing initiating the bridges. Now, in the, what really should have happened probably a long time ago is you should have a team that owns the platform. This is how for our corporation we're going to take alerts and how we're going to page people and sort of this inputs outputs thing. Uh, but then the, the exchange guys, the exchange engineers should have been the ones accountable for the rules. How should that management pack be tuned? But instead of centralize all of that stuff under, under ops because ops is not really getting rid of anything you, that they want to keep anyway because nobody want if, you, if, if the central ops team didn't know exchange well certainly they don't want to be accountable for tuning that management pack the exchange guys should own that piece the IP of the monitoring stack the ops guys should own the platform so if we have an outage and we didn't catch it by monitoring if there was no rule that accountability clearly lies with the engineering team if there was a rule but it didn't get ticketed or didn't get paged or didn't get picked up by the monitoring platform, then that's an operations accountability. And so that sort of that, it's not just business as usual, it's it's really using this model to redefine the hub aspects and then say which pieces should be in the hub, which pieces should be within the application or engineering teams. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. And this model really like, should be fun for operations. They're not losing anything that's worth keeping. Nobody wants to be the guy getting yelled at because we didn't have a rule for exchange when the ops team isn't funded to have exchange guys anyway, you know. And so it's really about putting that accountability where it needs to lie. And, and this also isn't an opportunity, you know, it's really about changing that discussion. It's not that ops is losing anything. It's really about ops becoming a strategic asset to those application teams. So it's looked at the application team should look at them as, as a series of services being provided that they can take dependencies on and avoid having to, to invest in those things themselves. And, and, and then one other thing there is the ops teams really need to think of themselves as an app team and run services for their customers, which happens to be all of their internal app teams. <clears throat> and so really then the question becomes, as an ops team, or what you know historically would have been called an ops team, where do you start? The first thing is the service map. That's a, a, a Microsoft patented uh, approach to managing uh, managing infrastructures or any service, whether it be cloud underpinned or not, and then defining those capabilities. So I want to dive into monitoring a little bit because I think that's the easiest one uh, to sort of start with. And there's many more. Other priorities would include major incident, uh, release management, that, that sort of thing we'll talk about in a little bit. Okay. But with on-premise email, let's take that. You know, this is an exchange-hosted environment. At the simplest view, there's uh, you've got your email uh, service. You've got a number of apps. You've got your hardware models that, that are running your email. You've got your different server roles, so your front ends, your back ends. And then you've got all these underpinning services. Now, notice the capabilities. They connect with Outlook, connect with mobile, connect with browser. When we flip the bit and move this thing to the cloud, if we're not in a hybrid world, which, of course, most of our enterprises are, but just to keep it simple, we're assuming non-hybrid, no exchange service staying on premise here the capabilities stay the same but we add a handful more underpinning services and so really this view I think helps simplify so the question becomes where should what should I monitor right and let's take an app and we move it to Azure we've got a on-premise line of business app here we've got a custom line of business app for uh, an order app so place order confirm order ship and order those capabilities there, uh, the apps, the hardware, the roles, and then the underpinning services. Once we move this to the cloud, let's say we move it to PaaS and SQL Azure, uh, we've got the, the, the capabilities are the same, the apps, the custom code are still the same, and then the server roles are still the same. I've got my front ends, my worker roles, my web roles, and so forth, but then I've added a number of underpinning services. So if we take this, this a little bit further to say if I were a customer, what would I want to do? From an ops perspective or even an app perspective, moving to Azure, there are two pieces to the puzzle. First is process and tooling planning. 
I, you know, from speaking with me before, Lax, I absolutely want to change as little on this front as possible because I think there's enough change in most organizations uh, moving to the cloud without saying we're going to change everything, you know, we're going to bring in a bunch of new tools or we're going to redo everything we've thought about with monitoring. The, usually with the people and process and tool aspects, the, the least amount of change you can have, the better. But there are some very critical things that need to change. So the question is, what processes need to be updated? What tools need to be updated to be able to support this uh, this move to Azure? The second thing is the roles and responsibilities. So helping to draw clarity between what does the infrastructure team do, or what does the ops team do, what does dev do, what are the roles that I need, you know, what are the accountabilities? So if, to, back to that monitoring example, if I've got my monitoring team, uh, the ops guys or infrastructure guys providing this monitoring as a service hub thing, and I've got my app guys building the rules, well, what are those accountabilities? Where are those breakdowns and accountabilities? How are we going to measure those folks to make sure that they're, you know, they're, they're being successful in this new model? And then how does all of that measurement and accountability stuff tie back into the left-hand side here, which is your processes and tools? And so our recommended approach is start with the service map down here at the bottom. Service monitoring is next. That's number one. If you don't know it's down, you don't have a chance to be successful. Uh, you need to know, you know, to delight your customers. If you don't know, if you don't know it's down, that you're going to have a tough time delighting your customers. Because it's not always the incident. As a, you know, if, as an IT provider or even as a, a service SaaS provider for us, it's not always the incident. It's the fact that you, you have to, that, every incident, just like if you have a flight canceled and you travel quite a bit, Lex, I know I do. If we have a flight canceled, it's not always the fact that the flight gets canceled. We sort of understand that. It's how this, the, the airline handles my issue and the fact that I'm going to miss my son's football game this weekend because I can't get home. The fact, the way that they handle that incident often is more important to me as a customer than uh, and how they communicate it to me and so forth is more important to me than the fact that they had an incident because we all understand incidents. And so the monitoring piece is critical to that. Then major incident management is really important. So when it is when they're down, when the customer's line of business app or, or whatever workload they're running is down, how are they handling that? Are they notifying the right people within their corporation, their end users? Are they notifying them? Release management, if you can't deploy code or uh, whatever applications you're running in Azure, you know, that you're pretty much <laughs> locked up. We have to be able to deploy because you're going to be learning from the incidents. You're going to, the whole point is you need to be agile to take the advantage of Azure. So let's make sure that uh, the release management stuff is, 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 is working well. So for example, from an ops perspective, usually on premise, it's about controlling change. It's about um, you know, we've got one production environment because it's a huge investment in, in servers and data center and all this stuff. So we have to be really careful when we bring it online. With the cloud, you get new opportunities to say, look, I could have two versions of production. One is, is actually active. This other one I can upgrade whenever I want to. And then when I cut over, I'm just simply doing a VIP, a VIP swap or an IP address swap to see which, which, uh, which, which instance of the service is live right now. And then rollback, that becomes a lot simpler. You just VIP swap back. And so there's a lot of opportunity to balance sort of the what used to be looked at as legacy control. To do that in the cloud, you can still have the same types of control. You just think about it differently, and that enables dev and the business to be a lot more agile. Um, problem management, not fluffy problem management, but real world what data do I need to be getting out of my major incident process, out of my release management process? How do I get more value? and data from the things that our ops people or dev guys are doing just every day anyway. So for example, if I had an outage, don't you think I might want to know how many users were impacted? How, uh, how quickly did I catch it with monitoring? Did I catch it with too many alerts or too few alerts? And then what are the metrics that those drive? And then finally, the, the normal incident and service desk aspects, uh, looking at the, what are the key things that need to happen there. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that the customer go revamp all of these processes across their enterprise. What I'm saying is they need to look at them with their cloud glasses on and say, okay, for every workload that I move to Azure, or you know, if I move to Office 365 for that matter, what are the key pieces of each of these processes that I need to update, and are my tools ready to support them? And if they're not, how am I going to make up for that tooling gap so that I can move and be successful in the short term? Yeah, so a couple of quick questions. For release management, do we control uh, things like hotfixes, or does the customer control?
control how hot fixes to get deployed, et cetera? It really depends. You know, if they're in an IaaS world uh, and they're managing their own VMs, they're going to control that. In a past world, we're going to do a little bit more of that. But the reality is, you know, the the um, there, there's some of that that they need to plan when they control it. But really, I think that probably the more important piece here is with respect to their line of business apps or the code, the service layer that sits on top of those components. Because the components are all going to be different. So, for example, if a customer's got uh, unless you're in a pure IaaS world, they're going to likely have a combination of that. So most customers, as they move a line of business out to the cloud, they're going to have some IaaS footprint. Uh, they're going to have some uh, PaaS footprint. They're going to have some SQL Azure. They're going to have some HD Insights. In all of those things, the answer to that question, Lex, is a slightly different. And it's one of those it depends things. But the question is, if they back up from that, how are they going to be successful looking at the service in the end and deploying that thing and being able to to be uh, add that agility and through concepts like VIP swaps from two production instances or, or deployment rings like what we did in Office 365 or, or otherwise? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. That's awesome. Okay, all right, we'll just keep churning here uh, a little bit more. Uh, the bow tie approach for modern service management is what I like to, to focus on. And so that little green circle at the center of the bow tie, you know, you've got on the right hand side, you've got operations or what was legacy ops and process. On the left hand side, you've got app dev. Those things usually, the further out you go, you know, are, are sort of, they just think differently. There's always that, you know, if you look at the legacy world, the app guys threw this over the fence, and the, that's what the ops guys would say, or the ops guys would, the, the app guys would go, well, the ops guys aren't ready to take my stuff. You have to bring those together in the new world to get the benefits of the cloud, and, and really, uh, it's not just about the benefits of the cloud, because every enterprise really is moving in that direction, so it's competitive. Uh, it's a competitive thing for every business on the planet to be able to save money and to be able to be more agile and capitalize on market opportunity more quickly. The cloud enables all of that. The question is now how do we bring that left-hand side and the right-hand side together? And the idea is this that hub thing. And it's not that I want to hub a bunch of things. I don't want to play take the old world ops and play it forward. What I want to do is say, for each one of these core pieces, this is, the, this is the piece that should be in a hub, this is the piece that should be distributed, and here are the roles and responsibilities that are going to help us be successful with that. And so taking that monitoring a little bit further, you know, the outcomes here, and there are really four for any incident, and again, if I'm talking about a line of business application here uh, for, the, uh, for customers, if, I, if they move their line of business app from on-premise to something that's hosted in Azure. The four outcomes are, number one, they caught it. They told their users quickly, uh, and their, their customers didn't call their help desk. That's the best scenario, the top one. The bottom rectangle is the worst case, which is we didn't catch it, we didn't tell the users, and the customers all called our help desk. Um, and then uh, the yellow kind of middle left rectangle is we caught it, we told our users, uh, the customer still called us because they didn't consume the information through our internal portal or whatever uh, as, a, as a customer IT organization. And then on the right, uh, we caught it, we failed to communicate it quickly due to a problem. Uh, but, you know, basically maybe we had too many alerts, for example, to tell us that we were down. And so the customer just needs to evolve that, this idea of a monitoring hub I've been using. It should be managed as a service. What are the defined inputs and outputs of that? The likely inputs, things like events. So if I'm a ops guy and I used to own the SCOM infrastructure or third-party monitoring or whatever, and some management packs for email or SQL or whatever, you know, now I want to be really good at saying this is, okay, I'm Mr. App Team, I'm going to take events. When you onboard your app to my service, I'm going to take events. And here's how I'm going to take events. And when I take events, that's, those are going to be my inputs, and I can output them to you through tickets in our ticketing system, through pages, through phone calls. I will have my humans back up your automation. Because go back to the early event, the, the, a couple of the early slides, Lex. You know, I talked about how maybe in a lot of customers, the app teams are building their own sort of scripts to page themselves. It's an easy discussion usually with an app team, app dev team, because you say, hey, who who is going to, if that script fails, that's going to page you in the middle of the night when it when it dies, and that script fails, who's going to who's going to make the call then? And they, they don't know because they're not staffed 24 by 7. Or the next question is, okay, what happens when the, the script works and the guy that you page is outside of cell coverage? What happens then? Are there humans backing that up? And they say, well, no, we don't have humans backing that up. And I go, well, the ops guys over here, they've got a team to help you with that. 
Now let's be very specific on how you want them to babysit your scripts and what you want them to do once those scripts fail. Or if the guy doesn't join the bridge within five minutes, what are we going to have those guys do? And so there's a huge opportunity for operations. We just need to, to evolve and retool. I will say, too, on this monitoring aspect, I, I can't, you know, on this webcast, we can't talk forever about it. I mean, I could, but I know it's not the right thing to do. There's an ITIL for cloud series that I'm writing uh, on the monitoring topic. And so just go to axelos.com. That's the company that owns ITIL uh, to their blog page. Search for me. And then you'll see, I think, it, as of this moment, so it's May 4, 2015, there are five blogs in that series uh, that have been posted. There's probably five to ten more that will be posted in this monitoring series. Just read I encourage the customers to read them in order from published date forward. So the first one is September of 2014. Just read those, and it will help add a lot more context to, to what I'm talking about with respect to monitoring. And again, I think that monitoring evolution is the first, is the easiest one, and it also, based on that little upside-down triangle model that I gave, is probably the most important. It's the best place to start. All right, one more, one or two more slides here on monitoring to, to make it a little real, more real. You know, the first thing that, that when a customer is moving a service line of business app to Azure is this idea of capability monitoring. So usually on premise, capability monitoring would have been really important to know if you know you've got this service running, uh, this widget making app or order app. Uh, if it's not running, you need to know. But usually. Customers' help desk were really good at recognizing the patterns. And so what would happen is the help desk would get 20 calls in 10 minutes, and they'd push a big red button for this app, and everybody would race to the bridge. The problem is when you move to the cloud, those patterns change. Because of the massive scale of the service, and also because of the geo load balance nature of the service. And so um, you need to make sure that you get that big red button pushed somehow. And the best, the best way to know you're going to get it pushed is to have really good capability monitoring. So. Things like uh, how do the dev, how should the dev team think about instrumenting their code or logging information so that the monitoring hub guys, the ops guys, can pick that stuff up really, really easily. And this goes back to the previous slide where the ops team had better be doing a good job of explaining, here's how I'm going to take inputs from you. Here's how I'm going to take outputs and give you outputs. And so there's a lot of opportunity, SCOM. There's third-party stuff out there. Uh, do you do it at the, the virtual IP address layer? Do you do it at the direct IP address layer? Are we checking it from the Internet? Are we checking it from our LAN? Uh, and, and so forth. There's a ton of options there, but this capability monitoring is the most important. The second piece is, is my app healthy? And so we've got App Insights. There's New Relic. There's so, they're a partner of ours. There's tons of opportunities opportunity, the tons of third part, other third parties there, uh, but the reality is there's a piece of that that once that capability monitor fires, how do, I, how do I find root cause quicker and fix root cause quicker? And some of these other number two, three, and four play in there. And so app, app uh, for custom line of business apps, that app health is important. Uh, next is subscription monitoring. So does Microsoft think my subscription is healthy right now? The public dashboards are not going to give me that. I need to be authenticated. That way Microsoft knows what subscriptions I have and whether or not the capacity that underpins those subscriptions is healthy. You can get that from the Azure Management Portal. And also about a week and a half ago, uh, a new API for Azure just launched, and you can get this tenant or subscription specific service health information from that. We actually, the product group, just published uh, sample code for that, both C Sharp and PowerShell code not last week, actually, which is awesome. We're making that number three piece easier for customers. That's pretty cool. So a customer can just write his own query and grab that data? Yeah, and yeah, exactly. And so that goes back to sort of that monitoring hub thing, Lex. Is wouldn't it be great for the monitoring hub guys now to have that instrumented uh, so that they're querying the subscriptions on behalf of the app teams and paging the right people when the subscriptions that their services depend on, those line of business apps depend on, are go have an issue. And then the final piece is this idea of infrastructure monitoring. You know, what, what are my VMs doing? What are my worker roles doing? What are my web roles doing? Can I can I do a table read or write from the my, my most important uh, SQL, Azure SQL tables. You know, there's there's a bunch of opportunity there. There's the Azure Management, uh, SCOM Azure Management Pack. There's Ops Insights. There's probably four or five. There's HD, HD Insights Management Packs and all that. That's where we focus in the past. Now, notice I've gone through one, two, and I've gone through three key monitoring things before I got to this one. It doesn't mean that infrastructure, this quote-unquote infrastructure monitoring isn't still important. It is. This is just to say, in the, in the old world as well as the new world, there are an infinite number of failure modes. A subset of those are quantified, right? 
a subset of those we have monitoring for. So that as an oper as a as a IT industry, we need to realize to go look there the infinite number of things that could fail. If I all put all of my eggs in this number four basket, I'm not going to do a great job with monitoring. I have to do more. I, it's a and, not an or. I have to have to be able to tie these things together and be able to monitor at the capability layer. Why? Because I'm moving to the cloud. And on premise, my help desk was really good at recognizing patterns, and we've already established that those patterns are going to change, oftentimes due to the scale of the of the of the the cloud providers as well as the geo load balancing. And then you just keep layering on. There are more questions. Is the customer using Express Route? Well, great. How are you going to monitor that? What about SQL Azure? What about Redis Cache? What about, and so on, right? On and on and on. And this goes back to the point that service map discussion is really important. What are the Azure components that your line of business apps are depending upon? So any, any questions or input there, Lex, before we jump into the sort of the premier discussion? Well, yeah, so uh, actually you just flashed to the next slide and I read it, and uh, that was actually going to be my next question, which is how does Premier help with this? You know, how do, where does Premier Services fit in? Yeah, so I mean, what really we're able to bring our experience from the product groups, which is where I came from. Uh, the one of my uh, old peers from from Xbox Live and from Azure is here uh, in Premier as well uh, now. And really, the idea is to take the the best practices that we've learned from running cloud services and running services at scale uh, for all these years. I know the ten years that I was in the product group, that's what I did. So that ten years of experience, and to answer these questions that our customers have: How do you monitor it when you move? Like what changes there? What about major incidents? How do I make sure I'm ready? Even even simple things like if I know it's down, how now do I need to communicate to my executives uh, around this cloud thing to let them know and set expectations because I can't control all the components that I used to used to control on premise. Um, how do you deploy in a way that lets engineering move quickly? while ops is still comfortable, right? So a lot of times the dev team, customer dev teams are off and running, they go to go into production. And the op teams, ops teams aren't comfortable. How do we how do we get those two to see eye to eye with some of the sort of VIP swap stuff and approaches that we talked about earlier? How do you institutionalize learning uh, from your mistakes? It, because you're going to have you're going to learn. There's going to be incidents. You're going to have performance. You know here or there again it, whether it's an Azure root cause or whether it's a app dev root cause or whatever it doesn't matter. The question is how do you get better and improve both the application and the delivery of the service. Uh, how does your help desk get ready? And then probably the red one here, I list it red because it's, it's the elephant in the room in most cases. Ops and engineering sometimes are battling around, you know, con, you know, control and who does what and how, how do we make sure to slow this thing down so the risk, corporate risk isn't there, but at the same time speed up so that uh, we're able to capitalize on market opportunities as, as, as for the customer's business. What does dev do? What does ops do? How do we get them to work together? They're bringing those best practices from our product group. The way that we do that is in an offering uh, that we call Proactive Monitoring Incident and Service Desk for Azure. We've got a parallel one of these we talked about uh, for Office 365 a few months ago. But really, first is about shifting that paradigm to the cloud. What things are different? How should I think about things? What does my ops team need to do to evolve? How should my dev team think about things differently? Um, getting those engineering and ops teams working together, and because those roles and responsibilities are understood, having a monitoring plan for whatever app or service or services that you're moving to the cloud so that you're not blind, you know things like, you know, there's tons of little things like that subscription uh, subscription query stuff that we went through a minute ago. Uh, your major incident plan, your release policy, your release plans, problem management, all of that stuff, but real world lessons learned. So coming in, spending a couple of weeks with the, uh, with the customer to help them sort of jumpstart that so that they don't learn the lessons that we've already learned the hard way. The idea is to, to take the lessons we've learned ourselves in our product groups as well as lessons that our other customers we've worked with have learned the hard way package those up to shorten the shorten the learning curve for the customers and it's the way that we do it is through a uh, series of knowledge transfer so like for monitoring here mr. customer here's how you should think about monitoring differently now let's plan it's a little bit of knowledge transfer then a lot of planning bringing your dev and ops teams together and saying okay when we leave it's not it's your plan for monitoring not my plan because I can give you white papers all day long the question is how do we help make that real for your culture for your current tools without bringing in a lot of new tools and so forth right the easier and more efficient we can make this the more the customer benefits from it that's right awesome well listen thank you so much for that presentation that was really insightful and interesting and a lot of fun um, 
Uh, anything left? Anything you want to add? Is there uh, another website, an internal web or an external website, maybe that we can send customers to if they have any questions? Yeah, no. The key is just to, to contact their TAM and uh, ask them to engage the ITSM or the IT service management team, and we'd be more than happy to have a conversation uh, with the customers. That'd be, I think, the best thing to do. And Lex, thanks again for having me back. It's always always great to catch up. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there you have it, guys. If you have any questions about monitoring or any questions about any of our cloud services or proactive services, please contact your technical account manager. If you don't have a technical account manager, we can fix that too. Um, you know, we're, we're always happy to help. Uh, thanks for, you know, joining us for this episode, and that's your Taste of Premiere.